that's classic. We bring you great laughs and a unique behind-the-scenes look at classic television shows and movies. I'm John Cato. I'm an actor, voiceover artist, and also bring you an amazing insight as a moderator with over 20 years' experience in the television industry. Okay. All right. Well, wonderful. I am stoked, to say the least, to, to uh, have this day happening. Um, on my podcast today, I have none other than Sissy from Family Affair, Kathy Garver, who was also in the Ten Commandments. Uh, amazing career. I, I'm extremely excited uh, to talk about Family Affair and uh, just her career in general. So uh, that's the initial part. Then my guest co-host today is none other than Aaron Murphy, Tabitha from Bewitch. So I'm sorry, I'm a lucky guy. Today was an incredible day. I What could I say right out of the gates? I'm just thrilled to be here with you guys. So um, anyway, why don't we get started? Uh, Kathy, one thing that I wanted to ask you, I was I was looking over stuff and I was like, what was the initial audition like when you, you actually went to audition for Family Affair? Because I know that you were a student at UCLA at the time, right? That's right. Yes. And I had been working for a long time and I was uh, at my sorority, Pi Phi, and um, all of a sudden I, I got a call from my mom and she said, oh, you have an audition this afternoon and it's for a new series and uh, you need to be over in Hollywood at three o'clock. And I said, okay, I can do that. And she says, the only thing is they're looking for um, a blonde haired, blue eyed girl. And I said, oh, but mom, you know, I have dark eyes. And at that time I did have very dark right. hair. Beautiful Things have kind of changed through the, the uh, era. Yeah. She says, okay, I have an idea. So I run around the sorority borrowing this, getting like a blondish kind of eyebrow pencil from my sorority sister, Tudy Spottenberg, who was married to Gregory uh, Peck's son. Anyway, I, wow. I, diver I diverge. So my mom shows up with this, um, this stuff in the 60s. You probably don't know about this, John, and, and, uh, you're, <laughs> and you're too young, Erin, but there was this spray and you put it on your hair and instantly your hair was a different color. And so wow. my mom is spraying my hair and uh, I look around and I says, well, that's lighter. And she said, yes, except for it was like a helmet. I felt like, <laughs> you know, something out of Goldfinger, <laughs> this, this solid gold hair. Anyway, we go over, I meet with the producer, Ed Hartman, and um, I thought we were having kind of a nice conversation all of a sudden he looks at my hair and he says, what, what's the matter with your hair? And I said, my hair? And he said, yes, it's turning green. I said, oh, is it, isn't that funny? I said, oh, it must be the light or something. But anyway, oh I broke God. the ice, we talked, we had a great time. And that was the start of getting the part. Did you, um, oh now did you know at the start that uh, Brian Keith was already part of this? Because I had heard that Initially, Glenn Ford was offered it, and I, I believe one other, one other actor I'm I'm forgetting right now um, was also Terry offered. Thomas. Yeah, I think you're right. Oh, yes. Terry Thomas yeah. for Mister yeah. uh, French instead of yeah. Sebastian. They had already had the whole thing cast. They were looking for the final person. They were already going to start shooting the pilot um, the next week. Oh, and wow. Wow. so they, they were a little crushed for time, thank goodness. They had cast someone in the part of Sissy. She had gone to Europe. She had come back. She had gained some weight. That gave them pause. She hadn't signed the contract. So they said, well, and my, my lovely Adrian Hazel McNullen says, wait, wait, you've got to see this girl. She's great. So anyway, um, the stars were with me in many uh, different uh, connotations of that word. And uh, I got the part. Oh, I'll, I'll give you a little addendum to it. Okay. Uh, I have they time. sent me. <laughs> we have now 38 minutes. <laughs> um, so I went over to Max Factors. They sent me to Max Factor. And they outfitted me, outfitted me in this long, blonde, Alice in Wonderland type of wig. Along with this, uh, I went to the wardrobe, this blue and white checked dress. I really did feel as if oh. I was in Wonderland. Yeah. So I, I then went to the set that they had already totally set up and composed for the show. It was, it, the show was about to go on. Wow, that's and amazing. so I talked with the director who was already hired and we chatted, blah, blah. So time next, just like two days later, 
they called the sorority and I, uh, uh, I got on the phone and it was my agent. She said, okay, you've got the job, but they asked, please don't ever wear that wig or that dress again. <laughs> I said, never. And all my sorority sisters said, no, she's never going to wear that. Never going to wear that again. Anyway, that was how I got it. Oh wow. And, now, did you and Family Affair is one ahead. of the uh, Family Affair is one of the first shows I remember because you were on this. The, your show ran the entire time we were on Bewitched. So I was little, but I think, did you start in 66? Right, we started in 66. Yeah, and that's, that's when I started. So I started on Bewitched first episode of the third season and you were the perfect teenager you were the big sister I always wanted and I'm just I'll, I'll throw in because people watching our, our little podcast don't know Kathy and I are friends outside of outside of this so That's hi Kathy hi, it's good to see you again we just saw each other at a party last uh, last weekend for our friends 20th anniversary which was really nice yeah. That's wild how long yes. have you known each other I'm, I'm going to say because you don't know this answer. <laughs> and the, re the reason you don't know the answer is because we didn't know each other when we were kids, even though we were working at the same time. The first time we officially met was in Tucson, Arizona at the Michael Landon Celebrity Tennis Tournament. Ah. And it was probably in 1986. 86. And the reason I know you don't know that is because Kathy was there as one of the celebrities. And I happened to live in Tucson. So I bought a ticket to go to the tennis tournament. And so I everyone who I knew from the business was like, Oh, my gosh, Aaron, you're here to play. I was like, No, I paid to be here. <laughs> But that's when I met you. <laughs> ah, yes. That, and that was a good tournament. Um, I, I can remember vaguely playing playing tennis there, but it, it was super. And now we see each other at the Hollywood Museum Affairs all the time. And we've really kind of reacquainted. And we've got some mutual friends, Dan Gilvezan and his wife, Giselle. I, I did a, um, <laughs> I just happened to have a picture here. Oh, this yeah. was my character. Firestar in Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Oh, and so we don't have so a picture of, of Dan right now, but it was Spider-Man and his amazing friends and Dan played Spider-Man mm -hmm. to my Firestar. And so we were mutual friends and that's how we got together. And we yeah. also do fashion swap. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, you guys are you guys are heavily involved. Well, you know what? Just just before we go on, just tell me real See, quick. We're not on yet. We're on. <laughs> we're on. We're on. <laughs> no, we're on. No, but the Hollywood Museum. What's what's your tie into that? By the way, why don't you, why don't you tell me that? Like Can I tell you? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, um, that goes back to before the Hollywood Museum was even there. And I had a very, very good friend, Robert Noodleman, who is a Hollywood historian, who was actually uh, helping um, the, I think it was the uh, SAG Museum get uh, started. But he also knew about the Hollywood Museum and he also knew the um, people that eventually took it over, which was Ms. Dunnigan. And so it goes back bef to before it was even there. So oh. I knew about it. it I know about it because I went there for family affair to get my wig when it was Max Factor. It's yeah. the old Max Factor building right there right. in Hollywood and Highland. Yeah. So it, I had it, throw up cool. those boards way before it was was a museum and gotten lots of wigs there. I didn't know about it. I didn't know about it until maybe 15 years ago. And I'd always known the Max Factor building, but I wasn't aware of the museum. And I was invited to an event there and since I've become great right. friends with um, the owner, Danielle Dadigan, and um, it's just one of those places where literally they have every Hollywood artifact you could hope to see. They have a pair of the ruby slippers. They have clothes that I've worn on TV shows. They have things from basically every movie and TV show and Marilyn Monroe thing, things, and they rotate the exhibit. So it's forever changing. But I always say, if people come to Hollywood, go there. And it's so funny. We're not here to plug the museum, but it's true. <laughs> exactly. But it's, it's so interesting. No, it's such a cool place where it's right there. It's, it's kind of at the corner of Hollywood and Highland. 
And um, it's just one of those places you go in and it's cheap to get in, but I bring everyone from out of town there and my kids there. And it's kind of a really neat place. Yes, I we should send yep. this to a Harlan Bull, who is their, <laughs> their publicist. And oh. we did an ex child star exhibit, which was really fun because they've got a great big room upstairs where they have special special events and author signings, et cetera, et cetera. Just went to Rudal Lee's. I, and that's what I, I advertised our podcast on my Facebook this morning. And I, I Aaron, I took, I took the picture that we had, um, that we had taken at Ruta's. Um, isn't it fun, uh, John, to do a podcast with two women who know each other? <laughs> it, it's an amazing experience, let me tell you. No, I'm kidding. But, but the story is, this is how, this is how Hollywood today is being on your podcast. Kathy and I were at Ruta Lee's birthday party when I asked her to be on this podcast. <laughs> I mean, that's, right. that's what's so cool about it. That's what I love about yeah. it. Well, let's yeah. let's go back to Family Affair. Love the yeah. Hollywood Museum part, by the way, and I definitely got to get back there. I haven't been back there in a long time, but um, but I did want to ask you about Brian Keith. Um, obviously, you know, it, it, a lot of the discussion whenever I look at any interview with you or whatever always goes back to well, you know, uh, did he take his life, all of that? Hmm. I, you know, not that I don't want to know about that, but I want to know what was he really like, like as, as, a, as a, you know, as a co-star, as a man, because his image was always this kind of a macho man. I mean, I remember him in a film with Edward G. Robinson and he was his, they were brothers basically, which I always thought was kind of interesting. But, um, but he was just, you know, he's just a, you know, he could portray that kind of tough edge kind of guy what what was he like in real life well you know what you can read all about it in the re-release of my um <laughs> memoir surviving sissy which i'm going to do a, a signing of at the hollywood museum nice pitch um, uh, yeah and, and also i have another book coming out called family affair scrapbook and i have pictures of brian all over it and uh, what he was like i mean here is an ex-marine well first of all he was born like in a drawer almost because both his parents were actors and they were constantly traveling into the theater. So he grew up um, in the entertainment business. However, he went, I think it was 17, he became a Marine and he even won a couple boxing championships. He, he was a strong fellow. The thing about Brian, which makes him so appealing is that he had this really kind of sensitive gentle soul. He absolutely loved children and he related to them very well. So it was that great admixture of strong guy and, and not spiritual, but gentle um, and sensitive nature that, uh, you know, was able to color all of his performances. Yeah, and he came off like a teddy bear quality, to be honest with you on that show. Well, yes, yeah, but he was definitely not a teddy bear. And uh, he was very opinionated. And if there was an actor that he didn't like, and this Brian would, well, he altered his lines a lot, but he would just go, and Susan. Or he would choose not to look at them. <laughs> it was really, it was really wow. not very good about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he, he was strong in what he was doing. And we went through, he did, a lot of different, uh, of some of his own personal things during the five years. The first year he was really kind of up and he was married and, and uh, he had two children and they adopted three more. And unfortunately, one of them drowned, one of his children. Oh, and his, yes, and then his wife, Brian was really down to earth guy. He hated publicity, hated hoopla, hated all of that hoity-toity things. His wife, who is absolutely beautiful, Judith Landon, was this gorgeous ballerina and loved high society and wanted to go to all this, all these parties. So it finally got to such a point where they said, we don't have that much in common. And so, so the second year, he was in the middle of the divorce and he was hmm, a little down. The third year, he did Krakatoa East of Java. It's actually West of Java, by the way. And he met uh, Victoria whom he um, loved, and then he married her eventually, and, he, and then he was kind of happy the fourth season, and the fifth season he was kind of getting bored of doing the same old thing. And so after that, yeah. he, he went to Hawaii, and she was and started a new show, The Brian Keith Show, 
it only lasted a couple of years, but she was also in the show. She's a lovely lady. Isn't now I had, you know, I've read so much about the shooting schedule with family affair. So he had it. I mean, I'm not saying that he had it easy. I'm not, I'm not saying that, but I understand that it was very tailored to his schedule that it was like 30 days. That was the, that was his contract or something like that. Is that true? Well, he was one of the hardest working people in Hollywood. Yeah. He was not a bigger star because he hated publicity, but um, he fell under the Federson method. Don Federson was the name of our producer mm -hmm. and sure. he had originated My Three Sons. Now, back in the 60s in uh, television, that little black box, a star would look at that and say, oh, please, I don't do television, you know, and that yeah. I only do movies. So in order to lure a movie star to star in a TV series, Don Federson had to think of something to, to do. So what he did was make an offer that Fred McMurray couldn't refuse, which was he would only have to shoot all of his scenes within like 60 days, two months, right. um, and, and get and back then, because we were doing 39 episodes per season, not the eight wow. episodes that one does yeah. now, when, and they are a series, 39 episodes. But the kicker was, and this is what really sealed the deal, they got a percentage of the show financial percentage. Now that yeah, had yeah. really not been done before, except for Lucy, who was controlling everything. So he got quite a, a substantial uh, percentage. Oh. So when Family Affair came along and they were looking, as you first said, to Glenn Ford, but no amount of money or anything could, no, could get him to do it. I don't think he liked theater. kids. I don't think Glenn Ford was a big fan of kids as well. From well that could be, that yeah. could be. I, I don't know that. But Brian said, and Brian's agent said yes, and even Sebastian got a little tiny percentage. So that, uh, that was why. And so what did that do for the rest of the cast? We were shooting scenes from like three different shows in one day, all the scenes that Brian was in. So that was a wardrobe and continuity script advisors nightmare, but it came out pretty well. How did that affect you as an actress, though? Because I, I mean, not you know, not not that your your co-stars were not you know, uh, they were, everyone was a good actor, but I know you were, you know, I, I understand you went on to the Royal uh, Academy of Dramatic Arts. I know that act, you know, you are an as I would quote like an actor. You know, you've been at it since you were what like uh, a, a child, seven years old. Yeah. yeah. So what was that like for you? to act on a show where you're having to kind of change it up constantly and you don't have necessarily a through line, you know, to the next scene. Well, I think once your ca character is established, um, and then I was reading um, just like lines, you know, I'd read the script that night beforehand. And we, we went from green pages to blue pages to pink pages. So <laughs> they were always changing the script. So, but I had my character and I knew it. And this is really awful to say, but I'm really smart. I mean, <laughs> I, I have a master's degree from UCLA. And as you say, I went to the Royal Academy, but right. I have an IQ right. of 145. Ah! So I have this kind of like photographic memory. So it, it, it's fine for me. And it, that was fine. And the kids, they don't know. They, they are just playing themselves. You, you say this, they go over the lines. You say you walk from there to there. And that's what they do, which... In my other book, <laughs> Boy, that's you're, still you're... out. Ex child stars, where are they Hold now? On. Hold on, I'll help you. I'll help you. There we go. <laughs> oh, oh, good now. job, John. Good Come job, on. John. Okay. I read it. I read it, which I really enjoyed it. By the way, it reminded me of a book I had read literally when I was a kid called "Whatever Happened to," and it was about the child stars of the '30s and '40s, which is is great. But it reminded me a lot of that. Uh, a lot of what you wrote. So let, you know what, since you, since you did throw that in there, um, I have a question. The, the kids that were around then, I guess the younger, we'll say just the younger child stars at the time, which ones worked on the show and which ones did you kind of know at that time? Just in that's, general. That's so funny because I swear today, I just finished, I'm doing another book that will be out this year and the, for the family affair scrapbook. And one whole chapter is, um, who were the notable child actors on the show. And I, at uh, one forty-five, I finished that chapter. Oh my so God. So they're right on the top of my head. And, and the last one I did was Clint Howard. 
And so Clint was on the show and uh, his brother, Ron, was also in another Federson show, John Federson produced show, which was The Smith Family, which starred Henry Fonda. I know, because it only lasted one season. Yeah, never but, heard of it. Wow. Yes, just just one season. And uh, so, and it was a great, I mean, Darlene Carr played uh, one of the children and Ron Howard and Henry Fonda. Anyway, Clint Howard was on the show and then um, Kim Carrath was on the show and she was on, she played Gretel in The Sound of Music. And then Radimus Para, he was just the one I did before Clint. And Radimus um, went on after Family Affair and he played the young Kane in Kung Fu. And then he had a recurring part in uh, Little House on the Prairie. And Lassie. And, huh? and Lassie. Radimus and Lassie. I know I That's worked right. with <laughs> Oh, did you work with Radimus on Lassie? Really? Wow. He's a nice guy. He, yeah. he lives in France now. Yeah, he's still a nice guy. And wasn't Kathy Richards on the show? Oh, yes. Who's now Kathy Hilton. Yes. It's, she's one of those child actors. It's, it was a trivia question that I answered years and years ago that for some reason no one knew. Kathy Richards was on an episode of Bewitched where my character went in and um, took over a TV show with Punch and Judy, the puppets. Oh, yeah. And people totally. would talk about Kathy Richards, whatever happened to her. And I said, no one seems to know this, but Kathy Richards is now Kathy Hilton. She's Paris and, and Nikki Hilton's mom. She's Kim Richards' sister. She's a real housewife of Beverly Hills, but she was a really active kid actor. That's right. And wow. a lot of people have asked me, is this, well, and how is Paris? Um, as Paris, uh, you know, the city is Paris Hilton. You're, you're her mom, right? You're Kathy Hilton. And I said, no, I'm, I'm not. And that was because she did the family affair. Also, Paris Hilton and, and I had the same manager for a while. So there was confusion. I mean, as you know, everything is so intertwined in, uh, in, in Hollywood. Absolutely. And it was, and as I was going through these notable child actors, I see that, uh, Virginia Martindale was a big casting director at that time. So she would cast one person in Family Affair and then another in My Three Sons and another like in To Rome With Love, all the Federson shows. And then she would take, oh, nice. like Hamlin Furden was on the show. And in one season, she played three different characters. She was Alice and Angela and Eve. Oh, Eve Plum was on the show as well, who became one of the Bradys. I saw yeah. that. I saw that. Yeah. Pam Ford was a great kid. I'm so sorry. We're all interrupting you. No, Pam we're not. You're doing is, great. I love it. Yeah. I love, yeah, go. She's one of my favorite kid actors. She's she's on Facebook and, and I follow her on Facebook and we're constantly I do too. I on do each too. other's posts. But um, she was on everything back then. I thought she was great. She was the voice of Lucy. She was on, you know, Brady Bunch a couple of times. She was really a good kid actress. She was literally on everything. everything. I mean, look back, it's like the, the, it could be the Jack Benny show. It could be, uh, you know, Chuck Connor show. What was it? Rifleman? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, just every, I, I mean, you can just name it. She's been on it. It's just, it was crazy. Yeah. Um, Since okay. you guys are holding up books, wait, I'm going to quickly show you something that I know Kathy hasn't seen because I mentioned it to her the other day. This is the Academy Players Directory. This was how actors would get their jobs back in the day before there was the internet. Every single working actor, actress, kid actor would be in the Academy Players Directory and they were in all the casting director's offices. And the last time I did this podcast, Kathy, they got me talking about my Bewitched scripts, which I'd lost. And they had me look on eBay. And um, I found an Academy Players Directory that has me in it, but it also has you in it. Look, wait. <laughs> Look, you're right there. This is from 1968. Oh, I see. 1968. The good oh, shot. But there's Kathy. Hey, she's right under great. Terry. You're under Terry Gar, and you're on the same page as Annette Funicello. <laughs> and she's in a category that wouldn't even be a category these days. She's an ingenue. <laughs> yeah. They don't have ingenues anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I went from ingenue to character actor. I don't know what happened to leading lady. Oh. Seems like I kind of missed that one. Will you take a picture of that and, and send it to me? Oh, I love that. Thank you. Yeah, that was pretty, yeah, that's pretty great. nice timing to, to, to get that. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I found it had all the, it had all the other kids from um, Family Affair were in it. Johnny Whitaker is in it, and Nisa Jones is in it. Pam Ferdinand's in it. It's kind of a really cool thing. I look on eBay. Nineteen sixty eight. Is that right? Yeah, this yeah, one's sixty eight. I wasn't sure if I would be in this one because 
I didn't do, while I was doing Bewitch, which was 64 to 72, I didn't audition for other things since I was under contract, but I'm in there. So <laughs> you've got to keep your face in front of the casting director. So when the series is ended, oh, I think that, yeah. And, and they look back in the year before or whatever. And yeah. Oh, that was, that used to be the gold standard. Actually, you had to be in there. It was like, you, you got to be yeah. in there and forget it. Yeah. Um, sure. so tell me this with Anissa, um, you know, obviously tragic uh, what happened um, when she was on the, sh uh, when she was playing Buffy, obviously that became such a, a big part of family affair and Miss, Miss Beasley and, and all that. Did that affect any of you um, in any way? You know, I mean, it, uh, the fact that, you know, she kind of had her own, you know, rise to stardom, so to speak. Did that affect you at all during the show or anything like that? Oh, no, I, I, I don't think so. Not at all. Um, Brian hated publicity. Sebastian's, you know, oh, sometimes he would get annoyed if the two kids, you know, had a little more publicity than he did. Mm -hmm. um, and Johnny was not that competitive with her. And we were so busy and I was enjoying my life as uh, a, a young woman in my 20s going to bistros and I had my whole life. And I was doing other things um, because, you know, we only shot from maybe June to September and I would go off and do other shows and, and keep building my career and finding out if I ever going to get married, you know? So <laughs> I was, I, I, had, I had other, had other things on my mind. And um, so, and really, I didn't realize how many uh, things that, she was on until I started putting my scrapbook together and I was accumulating all this memorabilia. And then the fellow that I mentioned, unfortunately, he's not with us anymore. Robert Noodleman used to send me all kinds of historical things. And I was on, my difference was I was on like all these Star Watch and Teen Magazine covers and they had right. like all the screen stars at that time. So that was where my career was going rather than making an appearance or here's the latest um, Buffy doll or right. here is um, the Buffy makeup or here is uh, the crossword puzzle. Yeah. In 1966 was really the time when merchandising was really coming forth and they hadn't done that before. Disney had not even started with and that makes the merchandising makes more now than than the television series or, or the movies or whatever everybody has has a cup or something these are my fire star candles <laughs> merchandising one of the best pitch people i've had on the show I'll tell you right <laughs> thank you um hey tell me this so did that affect you know did that affect her or was she like you know, she didn't know any better because she was a child. And so it was just, this is just part of the job. No, because she wasn't such a child. Um, she, Johnny was six in 1966, but Anissa was almost nine. So yeah. she was almost three years older. So imagine nine and five is 14 Oof. at the, you know, and here she is with her hair still in pigtails. And, you know, she played that same kind of character. I changed my look throughout the years. She had same little pigtails, same short dress, and dragging around Mrs. Beasley. They made now, her do that, though, right? That was like, look, we need this. Like, I'm sure there was a lot of thought around merchandising and the le longevity of the show. And yeah. So imagine a 14 year old carrying around a little doll when she's living mm -hmm. in Playa del Rey Beach in California and all her friends are surfers and, and starting to investigate um, drugs and everything else. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, so when Family Affair was over, she had wanted no more part of show business. She mm -hmm. did go in an interview for The Exorcist and then that was it. She told her mother, uh-uh, I do not want this. Wow. And uh, again, yeah. Yeah. So the the ex child stars in, and again in the in this this new book that I'm writing, so many of them, um, it's a hard transition from being a child star to being an adult actor. Certainly. And and especially if you're in a series and you have your your publicist does this for you and your mother and father do that for you and everybody's I mean, you know you need a powder on your nose. Let mm -hmm. me see. Are you perfect? Are you good? Okay. So then. Hello, the party's over. The spotlight's gone. You, you're having trouble getting another job. 
A, because you're not that cute little thing anymore. Right. Two, um, because you never really learned how to be an actor. You just knew how to be a natural child actor and learn your lines and do what you were told, which was very admirable in a child star, but no good for a, an emerging adult. Sure. And then you were going from 14 to adulthood, which is the most difficult age in the first place, trying to find your identity. Who am I and what am I doing here? And that's and, right when the series ends, right? She's uh, 14 and it ends. Yeah, and right. they, don't want, they don't want a 14-year-old to play a 14-year-old when they can hire an 18-year-old to play a 14-year-old who can work more hours. They don't have to have a set teacher. So yeah, that that's a terrible time. I mean, with, with Bewitch, at least, I was eight when it went off the air. So it wasn't like I was at an awkward age. I was still at a kind of viable age in the industry. But I have the same Anissa stories where we had 66, we had Tabitha dolls, Tabitha paper dolls. Yeah. I didn't get to be in any of the cool teen magazines I had to go like tap dance at the mall. <laughs> that was my thing. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And and that's and you know and that is a great point because then they take the eighteen year olds to play the fourteen year olds. Yeah. Oh, that's really tough. So what about? Did they ever have? This, oh, sorry. Did they ever have oh. sissy clothes? I'm dying to know. Were yes. There's... Yeah. I at love... at the, the fifth season, they they finally got uh, uh, sissy clothes. But this is what the kids never got was their own car. <laughs> <laughs> so I got to drive around the Pontiac was was our sponsor. So I got to drive around Pontiac and this I even hate to admit now because I was in the sorority and the first and our, our sponsor was uh, Benson and Hedges and Marlboro cigarettes. So they would send cartons of cigarettes over to the sorority. So I hope I'm not responsible for any. Oh my gosh, that is wild. <laughs> that really is. Did you, by the way, did you um, stay at UCLA during the, the filming of the show? Yeah, and that's another thing I did. I was, I was actually in my third year, I'd completed three years by the time I started Family Affair. Wow. And just right at that time, they were bringing um, back this semesters. And so you could go like, a, a abbreviated semester so I graduated from there. yeah I would go back and then I graduated from there Very and then I went back after the show was over to get my master's okay all right so let's go back let's go back I want to you you mentioned Sebastian Cabot a couple of times and and you did ca catch my ear when you said uh and he got a portion of the show as well did, I, I was kind of blown away by that I'll be honest with you I I get Brian Keith I mean I I could see that in a heartbeat especially with the Fred McMurray part but actually Sebastian Cabot also got a little portion? Yes, Brian got 25%, Sebastian got 10%. Uh -huh. And um, he, it, it was a lure for, for him as well. He was, you know, kind of on the fence and, uh, but that you know, took him over into the green grass. I guess it did, without a doubt. That's, that's really interesting. And he, were you close with him? Because, um, you know, just, I don't know. I'm just curious. What 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 was he like? Per, like he always had that image of, you know, funny. But he had that like he played that British butler mm -hmm. kind of thing so well. What was he like when the cameras were off? Well, I'm looking at the looking at the whole concept, and you know, you're on a stage from 6:30 in the morning to 6:30 at night, and mm -hmm. Brian and Sebastian and the kids and I, we all had families, so we wanted to go back to our family. So we really didn't hang out very much with the other members of the cast. I went, Anissa spent the night at my house a couple times and I went to dinner at Sebastian's a couple times and he was very different than the way he, he was on the show. And he was the, this character most all the time and he remained in that character when he was on the set. You get him home and he's in his sweats and, and then he, he, he <laughs> comes kind of back to his cockney, you know, because he, he really, established the way that he was going to speak but you know he had a little drink and and all I want is a room somewhere <laughs> so he would get to um to to get his coffee he loved his family had a lovely family his his uh, wife Kay would visit the set on times and his daughter Yvonne his youngest daughter um did a couple extra parts and his older daughter who was an actress um was on like three different episodes as three different characters didn't seem to matter at that time they just played different characters all the time okay Kathy I might be remembering this incorrectly but did Sebastian Cabot leave and have like a cousin or a brother come back and replace him 
a while? Uh, yes. I mean, people ask me that question because like Sebastian was gone about eight episodes and they says, well, what's happening to Sebastian? And um, it, John Williams, who I absolutely adore and adored, uh, came in to replace him as uh, Nigel French. Oh, yeah. And uh, John oh, Williams right. was the mother of the, yeah, he was the father of uh, Audrey Hepburn in the movie Sabrina. Oh. And he was just a, a fabulous character. Anyway, Sebastian had hurt his, his arm and he had um, it in a, a brace and in a cast and he had this other thing wrong with him. But here's the thing, because of the way that we shot, we're shooting three different shows in one day. Oh, I forgot so, about that. Right. Yeah, so I mean, he should have just been out for like a week in one show, but really in that week, we had done like 12 shows. <laughs> and so wow. a pieces of them all. So that is the story about that mystery. Wow. That's now, what, what happened. And John know. Williams I, was great. Do you, well, I Sebastian mean. Sebastian got well really quickly. I bet he got well <laughs> really quickly. <laughs> Although maybe he was still getting a percentage of the show. So, I mean, that probably helped. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Well, okay. I'll tell you what, I'm going to shift gears completely. Uh, I want to know, and this is one of these things that when I read it, that you were in the 10 commandments, I went back, I watched it. Well, I saw, you know, look for the footage. What, um, and you were young, obviously, but do you have a recollection of Cecil B. DeMille? I mean, obviously, you know, it's like a legend that's beyond, you know, in Hollywood. Do you have any a, a, an honest like sense of who he was or even what it was like with him on that, you know, directing that set? I thought he was God. I mean, I was a, I was a little girl mm -hmm. and I was hired just as an extra. Yeah. And uh, the scene, and we were on Paramount and they built like a paper mache mountain and they had all these sandy roads and rickety wagons. And I was on one of those wagons leaving, uh, leaving town uh, in the exodus. And uh, all of a sudden, I hear this, this voice cry out, don't let that little girl's face get in the camera. And I says, is he, is he talking to me? Wow, how um, intimidating at that time. Yeah. And the thing was, he was on a great big crane way yeah. up in the air. So I heard this voice coming from, I'm looking around, where's this voice coming from? And when, you know, it was up in the, uh, the heavens of the, the top of the stage. And oh yeah, so, there's so many shots of him way up on these cranes. I swear that's like a classic DeMille, you know, photo. Yeah. Right. Yes. And uh, so uh, then he, he descended and I thought, uh-oh. And so I got, I was lifted down and I talked to him. And so then he had scenes written for me into the movie. And this was kind of, again, a part of his uh, directing and what his sense of what was going on, because he did so many great big epics and you kind of lose the audience because they get involved in the grandiosity of everything and they, they forget about the relate, relatability of, of the people. Mm -hmm. So he, will, he would pick out people and then give them lines and then um, it, that made the show and the movie warmer. So and he writes as I'm coming down the the stairs at the exodus and I'm saying grandfather do you have the pumpkin yes and then I say where's Rebecca and then this disembodied arm comes back and says here's Rebecca and it was a little doll I said thank you and I go over to the well to get water now fast forward and the Red Sea is closing which is a great big story that I'm not going to tell you now but it's a long story anyway the Red Sea is closing all the waters coming down but before that happens uh, Charlton Heston Moses comes up and he says, are you afraid? And I said, no, but Rebecca is my doll. So he lifts me oh. off the mountains. My sense is because I was like seven and at that age, it's like taste and, and, and look, you know, the, the five senses. What does something feel like? What does something look like? What does something smell like? We had, we had um, a whole menagerie of animals, of donkeys and horses and uh, camels and bears, oh my, no. But I would go and go down to the, uh, the stable and see all of those animals all the time. Well, you so were, those are my recollections. You were adorable though. I mean, I, honestly, I can see why, why he would pick you. I mean, I, I went back, I'm like, I get it. I mean, I totally get it. I mean, you, you can see it, you can feel it uh, in that moment. So 
Um, did you, um, one other one that I, I had taken note of is, uh, you were in an interview, I wanna say, I, I cannot re recall if it was for the Academy or not, but it was regarding Don Wells. Mm -hmm. And now were you, uh, I mean, you were, it doesn't sound like you were just casual friends. It sounds like you were very close friends actually. Um, uh, is that true? Yes. And I, I felt so badly for her passing. And uh, we were, we took a road trip a couple of years ago because we were going uh, to the Western Legends Roundup in Kanab, Utah. Mm -hmm. And at that time, she, her dementia was, you know, starting to come in. Oh, I didn't and realize just, that. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's what, um, that was so, so sad because we'd be going down this, this road to, oh, that's where they, they put those. Um, that hotel. Can you imagine in the middle of nowhere putting that hotel? Well, you know, that's where they put the hotel. Can you imagine the middle of nowhere putting that hotel? So, you know, and, and, it, and it was it was sad. And then she finally, you know, went into assisted living. And uh, so oh, I had no idea about that. I, I did not know. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's it's, that's wild. Yeah. I, I mean, she's always been one of those that really stood out for me, you know, just, I don't know, maybe as a kid with Gilgan, Gilligan's Island. Um, yeah. Don was, Don was, go ahead, Aaron. Oh, sorry. I, I knew Don really well too. And I didn't know I that. Was looking, okay, we were very, very close, but we met 30 years ago or more, but um, we did RuPaul's Drag You together <laughs> where RuPaul and and a group of um, drag queens turned um, three actresses into drag queens. So I did it, Don Wells and Charlene Tilton. So it was the three of us for a week, like making our own clothes, learning a song and dance routine. It was, it was awesome. If you can find it, it's online. But we did that and then we did, um, gosh, a bunch of things in the last few years before she passed. We did um, a web series called Life Interrupted and she was hilarious and I, I miss her very much too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can see that. By the way, what a combo. <laughs> I'm sorry. Those, the three of you. I mean, if I were like putting that on paper, it's like, wow, it was great, great casting. Um, so anyway, one other one that I had for you, Kathy, is I know that you and Brian, uh, Brian Keith, were both in the Spider-Man uh, animated movie. And now, I, having, I'm a voiceover actor as well, and I know that sometimes you go in and you do your part, but, you know, the other person is not there, you know, and, and you know, they're doing it somewhere else, or they did it a week ago. What was the case here? Did you actually have the opportunity to see him again at that time? Not at that time, no. <laughs> uh, he came in, and it was like John Forsyth also was on Spider-Man. I never saw John Forsyth, um, oh, wow. so I didn't see him then. I'm actually going to see Dan Gildazan this um, this afternoon and go pick up, up some pictures that that he had signed for the amazing you know spider-man so um wow, what a we, we stay in touch a lot oh yeah. yeah it is so and timing timing when now i understand that you went to the royal academy of dramatic arts and then that you know you 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 leave and then what you know what in general what was your career like after that what what did you focus on was it more um was it more television? Was it more theater? Was it, what, what was your course that you, you kind of went with? Well, I, I think again, when you're on and so recognizable on a television series, it's hard to, again, make a transition. And I had been hired to do this musical stage presentation in Israel. And it was uh, wow. about family affair. And it was called Hamish Bakashik Azot. Now I'm, I'm a Catholic, girl i'm i'm just spiritual primarily yeah. and uh so i and this was all in hebrew so i learned hebrew phonetically for this role and they they had lookalikes there was a lookalike mr french he really did look like mr french and uncle bill and and then i came johnny was afraid to come and then the so two little kids so i sang i'm mishpaka you know and so i did the whole thing that is wild. and while i was there yeah and so while I was there, I said, well, I'm over here. I think I'm going to go to England. What, I mean, I'm like 25. I said, I think I'll go to England. So I went to England by myself. I, I signed up for the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, did that, came back. And then what was happening at that time were dinner theaters all over the U.S. So yeah, very that, big. That, was, that was a big thing. So I, I made a career a year of, of doing and traveling all around doing dinner theaters, which was nice money. And it was fun to do. 
and uh, comedies. And then, uh, then I needed another transition. And so then I went to uh, voiceovers um, and getting like some television along the way, but primarily um, it was into stage and focusing on stage. I got you. And then I started, yeah. And then I started focusing on voiceover and now I'm, I'm just doing it all. I just finished a movie and did a TV pilot and writing a book and doing voiceovers and audio books. I've done like 80 audio books. I do a lot of audio books. Oh, wow, that's Kathy, fantastic. Kathy is the perfect example of someone who will always be working. She's always creating work. I admire you so much for that. Every time I see her, it's something new. It's like, she's doing a web series. She's doing a film. She's writing books. A lot of people will sit around and, and you know, like, oh, I did this. I'm done. I'm, I'm not going to do anything. She's constantly creating her own work, which leads to more work. And it's just, it's amazing. But I want to hear about the Western you're doing, because she's mentioned to me that she's learning to ride horses for a film that she's doing. Doing. I want to hear more. What, I what it is, is, it's not actually a film. This is, um, I'm a spokesperson for Silverwood theme park called Silver Wanda. And so uh, this is this theme park that all of a sudden just rises out of no place in Idaho. And it's the largest theme park in, in the Northwest. Anyway, wow. I did the audition for it a year, more than a year ago. And I was, uh, I pretended I had a horse, which was an, an ottoman and say, hi, I'm Silver Wanda, get to Silverwood, etc." And I took three lessons and my trainer says, they, they know if you're afraid, so don't be afraid of the horse. And I said, I'm not afraid. I ain't afraid of nothing. No, I said, I won't be, I won't be afraid. And uh, so I get there and the color horse that I had been taking the lessons on and it was his first time in front of the camera. So the poor thing was, you know, a little startled by all these people in this camera and all these lights around him. So I said, it's okay, it's all right. Now don't be afraid. <laughs> so I'm telling the horse, can I be afraid? And all of a sudden I turned into the horse whisperer. And oh I got my, oh my, my hand God. around the head. And I said, it's, it's okay, it's okay. And, and the, the other wonderful thing that, that, was, that was good about that is that the owner and the wrangler was a woman who was five foot one. I'm five foot one. We were oh, the wow. same height and about the same weight. So when I got on top of the horse, you know, I think he thought that, oh, this, this sound, you know, this feels familiar. This is okay. I said, it's okay. It's okay. And she also spoke to the horse very gently. So it was a nice combination of good things that happened. And that's the end of my story. <laughs> that's a good one. That's a good one. Um, yeah. I had a couple of things come into my head, uh, by the way, regarding family affair on the, um, well, first of all, what, uh, I guess, what studio did, did you, you, you know, were you shooting at? And then what other uh, shows were being shot that were around it? We started out um, at the Paramount Studios mm -hmm. and Don Federson was leasing the, um, the stages from, from Paramount, which then got so sold. And um, I think, I'm, I'm trying to think, yeah. So Gunsmoke was being shot there. Hmm. And um, I remember my mom and I, um, she brought my dog to the set and we were going to take a little uh, stroll around. I said, oh, mom, and that's where Gunsmoke is shot. And then James Arness comes out. How are you folks? And I said, we're fine. My dog proceeds to go up and pee on his leg. <laughs> <laughs> that Wonderful was a very Hollywood embarrassing. Moment. <laughs> yes, that I've tried to forget all my life, but it pops up because every time I think of that memory, I think of my horse and, and, and I mean, my dog. And, he was a big man horse. too. Wow. <laughs> yeah, he was. <laughs> yeah. And he only got the cuff, you know, I think on the boots. So <laughs> then because they sold Paramount, um, we went over to CBS Studio Center on, on Radford. And that was good because we were a CBS show and then they could make the arrangement. So he brought over, Don Federson brought over My Three Sons and a Family Affair. And to the other side of us was shooting Big Valley. And wow. I did an episode of that, I think during the fourth season during I hate this there's a whole nother story that goes along with that that's Barbara um, Stanwyck on that one right yeah Barbara Stanwyck yeah yeah yes. did, you, did you happen to meet her oh yeah we did we did a lot of scenes together 
and I played in Eris. That was I liked my part. Rode a horse. You see, I could ride a horse. And shoot a gun and <laughs> it all comes away. around yeah. to riding a horse. <laughs> <laughs> the whole show is about a horse here, actually. Um, what? Uh, tell me this. What? Barbara Stanwyck, there's a classic example, too, of somebody that was like, um, I mean, incredible actress, but I mean, strong, you know, presence on screen and, and, and uh, there was a toughness of, about her. What was she like? What was she actually like when you were around her? They had a strong presence and a, a strength around her. No. <laughs> she, but she, she was, she was very reserved. But sometimes you see, you can't tell. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you're just doing the scenes with them, because some actors will stay in stay primarily in character all the way through, even if they don't want to, you know, it's just you you get into the character so much that you just start behaving like the character. It's um, kind of a psychological crazy thing. That's that's why they call actors nuts. Crazy. Is that how she was? Is that how she but was? She, she she was she was reserved. She was strong. She had her head up. Um, she she knew her lines. She uh, was very professional. She knew exactly what she was doing, and uh, and that and that all came through. And so, I mean, that was like Sebastian, as I say. I mean, he kept that that character all the way through. Of children don't do that, even off the set, you know. <clears throat> wow. wow, wow. So, I, I found myself <clears throat> when I came home from Idaho. I was like, well, what do you all want for? For, for dinner. <laughs> you're still in character yeah i'm still in character so i thought you were gonna leave her in idaho um but but that was fun and then we had star trek and what amazed me oh, by wow. star trek i went in to to visit and they the way that we shot family affair we'd have the master two shot cup close-ups we were done so i went to star trek and i see and they start the scene and they're panning and they keep panning and panning and panning and panning and panning. I mean, it went on for like, you know, 15 minutes, the wow. one shot and they were just panning. I said, well, that's, that's different. That was my, my biggest recollection from my Star Trek. Um, were you, were you a, a, a fan of the never, show? I have, I have never seen it. Wow. Me either. Trekkies, don't kill me, Trekkies. <laughs> I, I happen to be a Trekkie, so I'm like, oh, no. How did you <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It's all right. It's cool that you got to actually see the set of it and stuff at that time. That, yeah. That's just amazing. Boy, there were well, some incredible shows shooting at the time you were there. Oh, yeah. I mean, see, like, Aaron and I, we were, that's the 1960s. We, yeah. we were not seeing, like, Star Trek. And, and, like, the Monkeys debuted 1966 as well. And Batman, those were all, and then the Monsters was, were just uh. before us, so. I'm a huge it was it was really an interesting banner year. Well, and when at the first year the things were in color, so I mean people really excited about that. Was your was your show the first, by the way? One of the first, yeah, 1966. And if you see it, you know that great big kaleidoscope that yeah, starts great. at the beginning. That's to remind you that it's in color. And look at all the pretty colors we can make with all the jewels. You know, yeah, the, yeah, the you're right. You're right. I can picture it in my head right now. That yeah, going around. And at the beginning of Bewitched in '66, they started in '64, so we had two seasons in black and white before it went to color. So people didn't have color TVs in '66, even though television was now in color. So True. at the beginning of every episode, Elizabeth Montgomery would say, "And now Bewitched in color." So people would then be inspired by a TV. Did she get paid extra for wow. that? Probably. <laughs> you would. Hope, My friend you would gave hope. me this lovely kaleidoscope. Oh, I love. I love kaleidoscope. Yeah, me too. Oh yeah, yeah. Without a without a doubt. Um. Well, that, that's pretty cool. That that's really cool. Did people come and visit the family affair set? By the way, as well. I mean, just like yourself going over there with other people. We, show we would have some guests. We had a couple contests of people wanting to be on the show, and um, yeah. Jerry, I think Jerry Mathers visited one time. I don't think he was ever on the show, but he came to the set to visit. He was in the, uh, what do you call it? The reserve, because he was wearing a uniform. Yeah, he's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. I'm going to see Tony. Yeah. I'm going to see Tony in, in oh, would you like to know what I'm doing next? I would no. love to know <laughs> what you're doing next. Go for it. Please tell, tell all the listeners. That'd be awesome. Well, if anybody's in the area, next weekend, I'm going to go to Terrificon which is in Connecticut at the Mohegan 
uh, Resort and Casino. And I will be, Firestar just came out with, and this, I'm, I'm going to bring some of these with me. This is the, the wow. Marvel um, the Firestar that, uh, that just came out this year, which is, is fun because I mean, this, the television series was like in the late eighties. Right. But it keeps going on. It keeps going on. And right now it's at Disney. So I'm bringing her and then my son makes these, my stepson makes these fabulous candles. So I'm bringing Firestar candles. Firestar um, candles. So here. that's, yeah. And so, and then after that, I'm going to go to the Mid-Atlantic um, Nostalgia Convention. If anyone is around Maryland or New York or the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And Tony, to, and what reminded me of, Jerry Mathers is going to be there and Tony Dow and so yeah, Jerry was on the podcast, actually. Jerry's been on my podcast. He's a super, super nice guy. Yeah. Yeah, he is. And his Jerry. wife is great. Yeah. Teresa. Is Teresa. Wonderful. Yes, wife. I agree. That, that was the best decision. And same with like Chris Knight. His wife is probably the nicest, sweetest person I have ever met is Kara, is Chris Knight's wife now. And now I think they've been married five years, but um, he's not going to be there. But <laughs> Tony yeah. and Jerry are, are going to be there. And Haley Mills was going to, but I, I don't know if she well Juliet her sister will be there and lots of nice people and we're going to do a couple radio shows I love radio and old time radio so I'm going to play Gracie um oh, to yeah. uh, George yeah. Burns and then after that I'm doing a western thing but this is boring I, I know I where told I'm you going. she's no, always not. busy she's always busy. want to know I think it's great yeah, I have to say, since Kathy's mentioned in conventions, I'm not plugging any, I'm not doing any conventions, <laughs> but when, when I do, I, there's something really fun about going, and just because we were on TV, we were also watching TV, so I've reconnected with so many other kid actors and people on shows like, like Kathy and um, people that I grew up watching just from doing these kind of um, memorabilia and nostalgia conventions. So you end up spending a few days with people who have so much common ground with you. So it is fun for the people who are there signing as well as for the people who come. I, I've made some really great friendships at those oh events, right, God, Kathy? Yes, great. you know, because when you're acting, and again, you may be in your series um, and they're on at the same time. And as I said, you're there from 6.30 to 30 at night, and then you go home and then you say hello to your family and learn the lines for the next day. So you really don't get out to know. And so I think too, you know, it's just been a boon getting to know, getting to know people. And, you know, and as Aaron says, it have common ground and you have, you know, so many things to share. It's great. Wow. Well, Hey, I think we've got, uh, I, I, I think we've probably come to an, our close here. I mean, I think you ended that wonderfully on, on telling us what's going to happen in the future. But yeah, you know, seriously, Kathy, I, I really appreciate you being on. I, I know we probably went a little longer than what, you know, we, we had talked about, but it was just so much fun to hear, you know, your stories and everything. And Aaron, uh, what can I say? I mean, I loved hearing, uh, you know, uh, all your stories that you brought in as well. And I just, you know, thanks a lot for being the, the co-host on this as well. It's just, it's just been happy great. to do it. it yeah, it's fun. It's great. <laughs> Bewitching classics. There, oh. there you go. <laughs> Whoa. People on my Facebook. Oh, name. Well, I'm going to, to co-host this, you know, with, with uh, uh, Aaron is co-hosting, you know, taking over a position and they said, well, you two should do it together. You know, you should have your own podcast and you should call it Bewitching Classics. And I said, Okay. Sorry, John. Oh, we'll talk about yeah. this when you're not around. Yeah, wait, wait, <laughs> well, no, wait, a, wait a, cut me out, Kathy. You have Bob. You have Bob. And I imagine you do all kinds of funny little voices when when Bob is here. You know. So true, true. But I hey, Aaron is a lot cuter Aaron than too, Bob. So. <laughs> right. No, total pleasure. It's it's just been uh, really fun to have both of you. Uh, you know, on without a doubt. I I, I sincerely appreciate the time, and um, I'm. You know, I'm looking forward to your new book. I really am. I really enjoyed the uh, the X Child Stars one. So thank you. We'll, watch well and you can get all my things <laughs> if you want to go to my oh, yeah, yeah. my website. You can go to kathygarver.com, strange name, and you can like me on my Facebook uh, fan page, and my Instagram is at kg sissy. And of course, all my books are on Amazon. So there you have it. That's my pitch for today. My my PR person would be very happy with me. <laughs> very, very, very happy. <laughs> I'll tell you. Anyway, it's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Appreciate Bye, guys. you. All right. Bye. Bye, guys. Hey. 
If you haven't done so already, hit the subscribe button in the corner of the video so that you don't miss any of our future YouTube podcasts. Also, follow us on iTunes and Spotify and leave us a review.